open the ears of our heart to hear you, discern your voice, to come into a greater contact with you through knowledge of you, through love of you. Guide this uh, class, guide our minds, our hearts, and uh, speak to us, Lord, and through this class. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our class today is called uh, Mysticism of the Word. And that will lead into class next week, which will be uh, the book of experience, our experience, as it mirrors the book of Scripture. Uh, so it will be about theology and prayer, you know, the objective reality of the faith and our subjective appropriation of it, dogma and mysticism. And uh, on that theme, we'll talk a lot about the fragrance of, of Christ and how Bernard speaks about that. Uh, but yeah, today it's mysticism of the word. And that's one of the great advantages of studying St. Bernard is that he does really open up before us the place of scripture in our spiritual lives and bringing us to the depths of contact with the Lord through the scriptures. So a mysticism of the word. And St. Bernard as a monk would have been immersed deeply, of course, in the scriptures, Lectio Divina. And, you know, spending his days pondering uh, the written word and taking that into his heart as, as a living word. And it helps us today who have, you know, scripture a big part of our lives uh, as Christians, as Catholics, as religious. Praying the liturgy of the hours throughout the day. It's so much scripture that we turn to, our own reading of, of the Bible. And so St. Bernard can really help us to open us up to get the most out of it, we'll say. And, um, yeah, it's very important to recognize the importance of, of the word, the power of a word. You can think about people who do negative self-talk all the time in their minds and how that comes out in their actions, how that shapes things. There's a creative, transformative power to the word, especially a word that God speaks. Let there be light, and it happens. There's light. You are my beloved and when we hear that word spoken to our heart, uh, it changes us uh, as his beloved. It elevates us to accept ourselves as God's beloved. So there's a power to the word. You know, parents who raise their children, what they say to their children throughout the day, it affects the children. It shapes them who they are, whether they're upbuilding words or they're words that tear the children down. A spirit of discouragement, words of discouragement, or words of encouragement. We know uh, encouragement comes from the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, which can be translated the encourager. Encouragement comes from the encourager, the Holy Spirit, and discouragement comes from uh, another spirit, the evil spirit. And so, yeah, words have a lot to do with encouragement or discouragement. And so the the records uh, that we can have going in our mind, the recordings we can have going in our minds uh, can be negative and can uh, hold us back, tear us down. And to replace that uh, with the word of God, what God thinks about us, thinks about situations. And it's hard to make that reversal because if you've been living with something for you know years and decades and you just decide one day, okay, now I'm going to live for God and think differently... Uh, it doesn't all happen overnight, right? Uh, it's a process. You know, decades of thinking one way is going to take some time to think another way. And so we take in the scripture day by day, give us this day, Lord, our daily bread, the Eucharist, but also the word. And you have to take that in to let us shape, let it to shape us, make it to open to the word of God shaping us in the way we view the world. And the other thing about the word to take note of is that how interior it is, right? The the word gets inside of you. 
you open your hearts to the word and the word gets inside you and there's that intimate contact. So that's where the word becomes such an agent of the mystical life and the interior life with the Lord. And this is how St. Bernard, this mysticism of the word come, comes about. Because you take the word in and there's an interiority to it, there's an intimacy to it that gets inside of you, the word. And so there's a close contact with the Lord through the scriptures. The words of scripture are reality-bearing agents. They're reality-bearing, words are. The words of scripture especially, they bear the reality to us. So it's not you know, like a Kantian modern view of epistemology. Uh, you don't really know the things themselves, you just know the concepts. Um, but no, that's not the way it really is, especially with the Word of God. The words bear themselves the reality that they, they describe. They're sacramental. right? The exterior sign of an interior reality. They bring the reality to us, the words of Scripture. What do we mean by calling it sacramental? Lowercase s. Um, and so to, to appreciate that, it's not just a mental exercise. In the life of faith, we're brought up into a lot of invisible realities. Or what God is bringing about in our souls, we don't get to see like you get to see the tree outside. And so how can we come into contact with the spiritual reality? We need words. The word of God. God speaking to us. God telling us what's happening. You know, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Do you see that happening in yourself? You won't if you never think about those words, if you never take those words inside you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's what's happening in our souls. And we need the word of God to, to help us to see it, uh, to uh, um, apprehend these spiritual realities. And so what Isaiah 35 describes about the new growth springing forth in the desert, you know, that's happening in our souls. Do we have a, a Bible here? Yes. Which one would you like? RSV, if you have it? Okay, hi. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so... Um, that's an NAB. Oh, it's an NAB? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. I'll be sure to read your personal notes. We can have a back Bible. No, I don't see any notes. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so son, you know, we need to... We read the scriptures and it opens us up to what the Lord is doing in our souls. You are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Uh, that desert land that your soul used to be is now breaking forth with new growth. So you read the scriptures and you get attuned to what's happening in your soul. The desert and the parched land will exalt. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strength in the hands that are feeble. You know, so you see, uh, you accept this. Yes, Lord, you're bringing about this new life in my soul. And there's something experiential about it. Uh, you, you taste it. You, you, you perceive it. And then he continues, strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. You read that and you, you start to be strengthened in this reality that's happening, that's breaking forth in your soul as a new creation. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. And you hear that word, you feel that word spoken by the Lord to you. And your fear begins to, to pass away. You are strengthened. Do not fear, only believe. Right? As we heard last week. Do not fear, only believe. And when the Lord speaks those words and you receive them, you, you stop fearing and you, you start believing more. That's the power of the word. He comes with divine recompense to save you. Here's your God. He comes with vindication. It opens us to what the Lord wants to do, taking in these words. He's coming to do something. He's done it in the past, as we read in the scriptures, and he will do it again. Uh, great is his faithfulness. Right? Because the Lord is the same God who's working in our lives, who works in the scriptures, in you know, salvation history, capital S, capital H. 
It's the same God who works in salvation history in the church, who works in our own personal salvation history. And he tends to act in similar ways. There's a sort of typology. Typology between the Old Testament and New Testament. It's the same God. And so he leads his people Israel through the Red Sea, from the place of slavery, Egypt, to the Promised Land. And what does he do in the New Covenant? Through baptism, he leads them through the waters, uh, from the place of slavery to sin, to the, the promised land, freedom of the children of God. So there's a pattern of redemption, a pattern that the Lord works according to, and this pattern gets repeated Old Testament, New Testament, into the sacraments we possess now, and we receive those sacraments, and the story of salvation history continues in our own lives according to the same pattern. We experience death and resurrection, periods of death, periods in the desert, and then periods of victory, a resurrection coming from that, new life springing forth, dead things coming back to, to living things. And so the scriptures you know, about God's story with his people, the way he acts, his history with, with his people, and it's beginning, it's, our, it's continuing to be played out in our own lives according to a similar pattern or form. Streams will burst forth in the desert and rivers in the steppe. So you read that, you let the streams burst forth in the desert of your heart. The burning sands will become pools and the thirsty ground springs of water. The abode where jackals lurk will be a marsh for the reed and, and piperus. Um, those, who, those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting glory. They will meet with joy and gladness. Sorrow and mourning will flee away. All right, so, you know, what we did here with this passage, you know, that's just a spiritual interpretation of the, of the passage, which clear, which I think obviously um, presents itself. You know, on the literal sense, it's something happening in a desert, <laughs> uh, the new growth of the desert. Uh, but obviously the, the author intends, you know, to describe something more, a spiritual reality. St. Gregory the Great says um, in his commentary on Song of Songs that, yeah, to stick with the literal sense is to stick with the husk. Uh, to get to the grain, the nourishing part, we need the spiritual sense as a scripture. That's especially a lot with Old Testament texts. Um, but he's applying the Song of Songs. You know, if you stick with the husk of Song of Songs, you fall into kind of the sensual. And so he says, you need to go through the husk to, to the grain, the nourishing part. How this song applies to love of love of the soul for God, love of God for the soul. And uh, that, that love drama breaking forth. And he says that, you know, we need... Um, okay, now I'll, I'll go back to that later. Um... So yeah, so that's the power power of the Word of God. Um, words have power in our lives, especially repeated words. They begin to take root in our hearts, shape the way we see ourselves, see others. Uh, then word have that interiority. They get inside of us. And there's that intimacy, taking the word inside of us. Think about the, the Last Supper, the, the Last Discourse thing. And... Jesus says, he's telling them, you know, I've called you friends. So this is like the second half of John 15, like 14, verse 14 and 15 or so. I have called you friends. And then how does, how does he show that he ha he's so, such on good terms with them as friends, that he's so intimate with them? All that I have heard from the Father, I have, uh, let me just read it. <laughs> this is just the New Testament, so. Um. Yeah, so there's something so intimate about the word. And to, you know, close friends, people entering more deeply into a relationship, you share the secrets of the heart with those you're closest to. Those you wouldn't share with other people or with just anyone. You begin to share the secrets of the heart. And so that's the tenderness of the word, the intimacy of the word. And Jesus shares the secrets of the Father's heart with us. So, you know, he's spoken about in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
If anyone abides in me and my word abides in him. All right, so that deep mysticism of the vine abiding, the branch abiding in the vine, how do we do that? Well, in part through his word. Through the word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. John 15, 7, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Then he speaks about, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. All right? So that's how he's saying, yeah, I've called you friends, and, and here's, here's how you can see that. Because everything I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. I've shared all the secrets of my heart. I've shared all the secrets of the Father's heart with you. I have called you friends. And so there's this intimacy to the word. And so St. Bernard, um, he has immersed in the scriptures. And and St. John of the Cross as well, and all the saints, you see the scriptures just flow, flow from them as they're speaking about things. And St. Bernard, it's hard sometimes to know, is he speaking about the word of God, meaning the scriptures, or the word of God, meaning the second person of the Trinity? The Son, the word. And that ambiguity is intentional, or it's right, because there is a fluidity. There is the movement between word of God as inspired scripture and the word of God as the person of the Son. It's very fluid. It's very, um, the, the line is kind of blurry in reality. The Second Vatican Council on Dei Verbum uh, picks it up on like a metaphor used by the Church Fathers and others. Just as the Word becomes flesh in Jesus Christ, so the Word becomes words in the Scripture. So the Divine Word, the second person of the Trinity, becomes words in the, the Sacred Scriptures. Parallel to the Word becoming human and Mary's womb. And so the word becomes words in the womb of the church as the scriptures are written. There's kind of a a parallel there. Not exactly the same, but there is a parallel um, reality there. And so, you know, so St. Bernard will speak about words of the word. These are words of the word, of the person coming from him and bringing us into contact with him. So that it's much stronger than we would think about today, but yeah, this reality that taking in the words of Scripture, you're, you're taking in the person of the Word. It's very strong in the Church Fathers and in uh, the medieval monks. Taking in the words of Scripture, you're, you're taking in the Word, the Son. And so there's this intimacy there, this directness of contact with, with God. Uh, hence the mysticism of the Word. And the same continues in John of the Cross. It's all about the bridegroom, who's the word, or wisdom, is another word that's used to describe this. Um, And it's it's much stronger than I think we would normally appreciate today. Any questions or or comments here? I have a question about when you're talking about the word becomes words. Is it almost, I guess the connection in my mind is Yeah, good. So that's the next place I've, I've, I wanted to go. So just uh, so last, yeah, last week we spoke about let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, mm-hmm. and we saw that that refers, you know, in one way to um, we no longer hear the word through the words of the prophets. We hear the word himself speak to us, mm-hmm. Hebrews one. Um, he speaks to us, the only Son, in very you know, in past and many in varied ways. God spoke to us through the prophets, but now He has spoken to us through through the Son, who is the Word. And so that is, let Him kiss me with the kisses of His mouth. It's no longer the prophets, but it's the Son Himself, the Incarnation coming to us. And then we saw in another way that Saint Bernard and uh, goes with this that 
builds on that is that when we read the word, the scriptures, sometimes our minds are enlightened to understand it. We're brought into a more profound contact with the words, with the word behind the words, the person of the word behind the words. And this, these lights and insights are a kiss from the Lord, a uh, more direct contact with them. And it's all coming through the scriptures, through our meditation on the scriptures. So just to, just to get some of these phrases again. So this is from origin. I mean, even in origin, it's, it's something like even coming to a deeper understanding of scripture is like a kiss of the word. Because yeah, he's spending all his days um, <laughs> exegeting scriptures, interpreting the scriptures, opening up the scriptures. So any times he comes to a, a, a deeper understanding of the word, uh, it, it's a kiss of the word. It's a kiss of the word. But also for him, within this deeper understanding, it's not just an academic thing, but there, there is an experiential contact with the word in a deeper understanding of the word. We can think of the gift of understanding, St. Thomas cause the gift of understanding is a deeper penetration of the truth a deeper penetration beyond our own concepts um and so yeah that's that's a a, a direct profound contact with with god th- through the word so let him kiss me with the kisses of the mouth and these kisses from kisses are coming from the scriptures uh, and kindle me with love and longing for him, with a prophetic voice, they proclaim. Um, let her pray that her pure and virginal mind and soul may be enlightened by the illumination and the visitation of the word of God himself. For when her mind is filled with divine perception and understanding, without the agency of human or angelic ministration to that direct contact, then she may believe she has received the kisses of the word of God himself. When she has begun to discern for herself what was obscure in the scriptures, to unravel what was tangled, to unfold what was involved, to interpret parables and riddles and the sayings of the wise along the lines of her own expert thinking, then let her believe that she has now received the kisses of the spouse himself, that is, the word of God. Moreover, the plural kisses is used in order that we may understand that the lighting up of every obscure meaning of scriptures, or the lighting up of the depth of scripture is a kiss of the word of God bestowed on the perfected soul. And it was perhaps with reference to this that the prophetic and perfected soul declared, I opened my mouth and drew breath. And let us understand by the mouth of the bridegroom is meant the power by which he enlightens the mind and heart as by some word of love addressed to her. By some word of love addressed to her. Her mind and heart are enlightened. Now that's a kiss of the word. To experience the presence of power, of a power so great in the word. Let us beg from God the visitation of his word, saying, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For the Father knows each soul's capacity and understands the right time for a soul to receive the kisses of the word and lights and insights of this sort. So what we see here in origin is just then continued in the monastic tradition. This way of understanding the scripture and the contact it brings us with God and the contact with God it is continued in the monastic tradition. Like Origen, the monks are just spending all their time with the word of God, pondering it day and night. Taking it inside themselves. Here are some quotations from the church fathers and uh, early monks. This is from uh, Praying the Bible. It's a book by Archbishop Magrassi, a Benedictine Archbishop who died probably in the past 10 years or so. One of the best books out there on scripture and how we should read the scriptures. Um, So Ambrose, you have shown yourself to me face to face, O Christ, I encounter you in the sacraments, and in your word. So the Lord really does show himself to us, that intimacy of a face-to-face contact with the Lord. And yet what Elizabeth calls a face-to-face in darkness, uh, yet that, that, that contact with the Lord. Honorius, on his commentary on the Song of Songs, he's an early monk, with all its ardor, the church seeks in scripture the one whom she loves. All right, so it's coming into contact with the one whom we love, 
Degrassi notes like about Lexio Divina, it is not so much a matter of reading a book as of seeking someone. Exegesis is not a technique, it is mysticism. Right? Because exegesis, you're opening up the deeper understanding, you're opening up the deeper reality. And by taking words into us about these spiritual realities, we're taking the spiritual realities themselves into us. Right? I mean, I can look at the tree, and I do take the tree inside of me in a way, the form of the tree. You know, that's Aristotle and Plato, that's how they describe cognition. You do take the form of the reality into yourself. Uh, but with spiritual realities, when you take the words in, especially from the word of God, like those spiritual realities, you're being united with those spiritual realities as you take the words in. Which is really amazing. So you could understand why the monks just spent their times floating atop the pages of scripture <laughs> and going deep in them. Yeah, exegesis is not a technique, it is mysticism. This opening up the word, we're not our hearts burning within us when you open to us the scriptures. The disciples say on the road to Emmaus, Luke 22. Gilbert of Hoyland, a Cistercian, and his commentary on the Song of Songs, he says, hold fast what you hold in the scriptures and touch lingeringly and lovingly the word of life. When I think about First John, that which we have heard, that which we have seen, uh, that which our eyes have, have seen, that which we have touched, we declare to you the word of life. So that happened in the incarnation with the 12 apostles and the disciples who knew the Lord face to face. But this is something that we're being brought into. But here's the passage, beginning of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Right? And that continues for us now in the scriptures. We touch the word of life. The words of scripture, but the word himself, the second person of the Trinity. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify it to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Right? That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, not just so you might have more knowledge, not just so you uh, might be able to understand this better, but that you might have fellowship with them in touching the Word, seeing the Word, taking in the Word. So you have fellowship with the reality that they encountered as well. And we have that through the words of Scripture. Right, and even people who lived in Jesus' time, they saw Jesus walking, but not everyone believed. So there was, even when they saw Jesus 2,000 years ago, there needed to be that word of understanding that enlightened their hearts to appreciate that this man, this carpenter, you know, he's, he's God. He's, he's Lord. He's Savior. He's, he's teacher. He's master. So even those who know, you know, encounter Jesus in his human life, they needed a word from the Lord to enlighten their minds and appreciate who he was. St. Augustine says, you know, that the Son is sent to us whenever he is perceived by anyone. When we perceive the Lord at Jesus as he is, at, you know, as Lord, as, as God, uh, the Son is, is sent to us or it comes from it, the sun being sent to us interiorly, invisibly. Invisible mission of sun and spirit. And so this word that gets inside of us, brings us intimacy, changes us from the inside out, uh, this word is, is one that, that breathes. It's an anointed word. It's a word with a breath, spoken with a breath. The spirit comes with the word to make it a living word to make it a transforming word, to make it an enlivening word, an energizing word, energized by the Holy Spirit. A beautiful word that comes up a lot in St. Paul. And 
energia, um, the energy that the Holy Spirit brings us. And someone told me that, yeah, no, this, yeah, this, okay, this is coming back. So energy, that's like was a new word created by um, St. Paul. Ergos, which means work. Energy, I think like to work within. Um, I forget the details, but I think like in Aristotle, you just have ergon, but you don't have something like en- energia. But it was, anyways, the St. Paul who kind of brought those two together. Something like that. Um, but anyways, so the word comes with the breath. The word is spoken with the breath. The Father speaks the word with the breath of the Holy Spirit to enliven us, to energize us in the Holy Spirit and in the word. Right, but it's not just like a wild energy. (laughs) It's an ordered energy. The word orders the energy and the new life uh, in us. Oh yeah, so let's, so these are church fathers. So this is Gilbert of Hoyland. Hold fast what you hold in reading the scriptures and touch lingeringly. You know, sit with it, linger over these, the fragrance you catch in the scriptures. And we'll see that in St. Bernard next week. The fragrance of Christ we pick up in the scriptures, of the mystery. Get caught up in the fragrance of the mystery, St. Bernard says. Hold fast what you hold and touch lingeringly and lovingly the word of life. Think of First John, the beginning. Unroll the scroll of life, the scroll which Jesus unrolls, or rather which is Jesus himself. Wrap yourself in him. Right? So the, the word of life is being unrolled, and the scriptures is it's unrolled. But Jesus unrolls the scroll for us so that we can understand the scriptures. But in another way, Jesus himself is that scroll. And he's saying, wrap yourself in that as you live with the scriptures, as you ponder them day and night. Wrap yourself in that scroll of, of the word of life. Is that amazing? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you know, it's beautiful. And that's what, you know, Origen, he was just day and night studying the scriptures, always opening it, you know, going to sleep with the word of God on his mind and heart. You know, wrapping himself in the word, and then the monks continue that in a more profound way. Even, um, uh, yeah. Okay. So, hold fast what you hold, and touch lingeringly and lovingly the word of life. Unroll the scroll of life, the scroll which Jesus unrolls, or rather, which is Jesus Himself. Wrap yourself in Him. Put on your beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ, for His word is a flame. Herein repose. Yeah, so this word is a flame. The Holy Spirit's there. It's fire and love. And as you wrap yourself in the scroll, you're putting on your beloved, our Lord Jesus Christ. You're taking on more of his virtues. You're becoming more and more Christ-like by taking in his word, wrapping yourself in his word. And so this mysticism of the word, you know, there's this kind of blurry line between the words of scripture and the word himself, the second person of the Trinity, And then there's this, as we conform ourselves to the scriptures, we're becoming more and more like Christ. And like knows like, especially with these subtle things. Only like truly knows like. So we have to become like Jesus to see him as he is, to know him as he is. And we do that through conforming ourselves to what we have in the scriptures, the teachings of the scriptures. We can, this, you know, reach this, you know, this is a certain high point in the, the Beatitudes. The more you live out the Beatitudes, the more you're like Christ. The more you're like Christ, the more attuned you are to his heart. The more attuned you are to his heart, uh, the greater intimacy you have with him. The more one you are with him in your whole being. And so this mysticism of the word then reaches out to our life as well and our transformation in Christ and our applying his teachings, living out um, what we read in the scriptures. So St. Bernard will say, the word becomes weightier with deed. The word becomes weightier with deed. <clears throat> so we begin to live out the word and it becomes a weightier word. Um, 
And when the Lord visits us, it becomes a weightier visitation from the Word because we're able to receive Him, being like Him. So we see all these things coming together. The words of Scripture connected to the second person of the Trinity, the Word, our transformation in union with Christ coming through wrapping ourselves in the Word, putting it into practice, the Word becoming weightier through, through deed. And so our life in Christ, imitation of Christ, um, identity with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me through living out what I find in the scriptures, his teachings. And so that comes together here too. And so it's a really rich nexus of all these different elements uh, in the spiritual life. A rich coming together of all these. Yeah, thanks. Can you just speak more into the weightier word and what that means? Yeah. Well, I can find it. Um, no, it's just... Um, right, we can read the scriptures and they can kind of like bounce off us. We can read the scriptures, but it doesn't make much of an impact on us. Uh, or we can read the scriptures and they, they come... They, they make an impact. They're, they're weighty in a way. And it's uh, our deeds are conforming our life to the scriptures that, that bring this about. So this is from uh, 71, 12, Sermon 71, paragraph 12. Okay. Right, okay, the word of God Right, so and, and it's interesting. So the word of God here, word is lowercase, so it seems like he's referring to this scripture. The word of God, comma, the bridegroom, is truth. So you see it's like mixing up, like, wait, you're talking about the scriptures. But the word of God, the bridegroom, is truth. Uh, but this, this word of God we have in the scriptures is, 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 is the bridegroom. This you know, now hear the rest. When it is heard but not obeyed, when the word of God is heard but not obeyed, it remains empty and as it were fruitless, altogether full of sorrow and complaining that it has been uttered in a void. But you, do you not see that if it is, is obeyed, the word seems to grow weightier because deed is added to word as it is strengthened by the fruits of obedience, the harvest of righteousness. This is why he says in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me. All right, so these deeds, obedience to the word and deeds, opens the door for more. Right? When deed is added to word, it is strengthened by the fruits of obedience, the harvest of righteousness. This is why I said it in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and doesn't just hear it, but opens the door, responds to it, puts it into practice, opens the door to Christ in his life and the way he acts, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. And so putting the word into practice opens up the door for more of the word and that intimacy with the word as we become attuned to him in his heart, as we're more and more uh, one with him in our actions and our sentiments of heart. Does that help? Yeah. I mean, it is kind of, you know, it's a little, um, it is hard to put it in like systematic fashion. Uh, well, can it be seen, I guess, in two different ways? So one, going to prayer, reading something in the word, you know, maybe when you're reading it, you're not really sure what what it means. And then you leave, and you're doing something throughout the day, and there's something that you do that connects directly to that scripture passage, and then the scripture holds a new weight to it. But then the That's other good. way is, yeah, coming into prayer and having experienced something with, you know, postulants, and sisters, whatever it is, and going into prayer and reading something and realizing this scripture is directly related to what just happened. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, that's no, that's good. No, that's a, another angle to bring into this. <clears throat> and it could be quite, quite profound. Um, so my friend, my Dominican friend from Ireland, Father Jesse Mango, 
Um, maybe I mentioned this before. Um, oh yeah, he's Irish. So <laughs> he's trustworthy. <laughs> he wants. He's. Um, yeah, he, he's convinced like passages that he's spending a lot of time on in scripture um, that your your life yeah it, it opens up you know events in your life begin to correspond to that passages you're drawn to in scripture and that you're reading and it's not so, so this is like the radical turn it's not so much that these scripture passages are illuminating your life uh, but your life experiences and situations are illuminating the scripture passage. Because the goal is, you know, this is eternal life, to know and love uh, the Lord, uh, to know Jesus Christ whom he has sent, to know the only true God of Jesus Christ. The the end is knowing and loving the Lord, and the events of our lives are, are ordered towards that. Mm-hmm. And so not so much seeing the scripture passage illuminating your life, as much as seeing your life experience as illuminating the, the scripture passage <laughs> you're, you're focusing on, and that you're, you're entering the contact with the Lord and knowing and loving him. I mean, it, it, it actually works both ways, but that's kind of the radical turn that he's kind of woken me up to a little bit. I'm still waking though, but <laughs> it's there. And right, and with the liturgy, it brings it to another culmination that these scriptures, as they are read, proclaimed in, in the liturgy, they do come with extra weight as the power of the sacraments are there too, bringing forth the realities and helping us to enter into the realities. And so, yeah, the, the liturgy is the end. The liturgy just doesn't strengthen us to live our lives as we should. So that's part of it. Um, you know, source and summit. So it, it, it's both. We draw from the liturgy as from a source to live out our Christian life. But on the other hand, the liturgy is the goal, the end point, mm-hmm. that knowing and loving of the Lord and our events of life bring us back to that you know, love of neighbor, openness of heart to neighbor, then we come with the heart open to the Lord more uh, as we approach him in the liturgy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so no, that's good. Yeah, I can yeah. figure that out. I was just going to say, um, maybe, yeah, like thinking about personal experience, would it also be, like, I'm just thinking of myself and when I was younger, maybe like late high school or early college, reading scripture, had a different weight to it than it does now. Like, almost, yeah, like, it not being at a place in my faith where it meant a lot to me. Whereas, like, yeah, maybe not putting it into practice or not really experiencing it, but now it's, like, alive in a way that it hasn't been before. So would that be, like, weightier? Is that, like, what he's talking about, too? Exactly, yeah. So that's, um, so by putting it into practice, um, yeah, it's more alive now for you. And so these, you know, kind of visitations of the word, yeah, carry more weight. Um, I think it is, it is connected to, so St. Bernard says in Sermon 20 that, um, you know, if the Lord wants us to re- reach intimacy with the now, spiritual marriage, complete intimacy with the now, what, what holds us back? Well, because our love needs to be tender, wise, and strong. Tender, wise, and strong. So that's what, you know, all of life growing in virtue, purifications, is to help make our, our, our love uh, tender, wise, and strong. Wise, you know, well-ordered, uh, with a, a life behind it, strong, um, even persevering through difficulties. St. John of the Cross is the same thing, that our love, he uses the two words, needs to be um, made more lofty, sublime, and, and more pure, no, strong, strong and sublime are his two words. Um, so our love has to be more sublime, less of, of the sensual, purified in that way, more spirit to spirit, more sublime in that way, more lofty in that way, more sublime, uh, but also more strong in order to receive such an embrace from the God, from God, who, who's love. So, you know, God's love is so strong, we're not strong enough to receive his full embrace. Mm -hmm. But through the life of virtue, through uh, the spiritual life, through years of following Christ, our love is made strong so that we can receive such a strong embrace by the Lord. It'd be too much for us now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's why we need the life of virtue, 
you know, one of the reasons we need the life of virtue. So our love can be made uh, more strong and more lofty, more, more sublime, more spirit to spirit, um, less sensual. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that fits well, I think, with what St. Bernard says. Uh, our love has to be tender, wise, and strong. And so, yeah, you know, comparing your reading of scriptures now to uh, some years ago, um, yeah, your your love is becoming more tender, wise, and strong, and so you're able to receive more from the Lord. And so our, our deeds <coughs> help that. <coughs> we can receive more of a weightier impact of the Lord and his love, a weightier visitation of the word. <coughs> And so these visitations that we've been speaking about and that we see a lot of in St. Bernard, visitations of the Lord to us, the bridegroom, they, they come through the word a lot. Through our meditation in the scriptures, eyes being uh, enlightened, heart being inflamed by what we read in the scriptures, coming in contact with realities that the scriptures mediate. Right? The words of scripture mediate the realities to us. They're reality-bearing agents, the words are. Um, they mediate the reality to us. And <clears throat> so these visits to the Lord often come from the Word. And for St. Bernard, um, a lot of it comes when you read the Word and you see how it applies to you and it, and it comes with confidence. Yeah, this, uh, this is describing me. You know, Isaiah 35, the new life bursting forth in the desert. When you read that, uh, and and there, there's confidence, uh, there's conviction that, that this, this applies to you. This is a word spoken to you, describing you. So the word confidence shows up all the time in St. Bernard. Um, and I think last time I linked it to that word parousia in the scriptures in St. Paul. We have access to the Father. Open, we have open speech. We can speak to the Father like a little child in complete freedom and openness. Uh, that's parasia, that bold confidence, that humble boldness. Uh, and a visit of the word brings that. It speaks to us with, with conviction. And it can be simple words. It can be very brief words. So I'll, I'll share this story. It's, um, I can change a little of the details to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I preached a retreat one time and, um, and then someone, um, yeah, preached a retreat to, to some religious and then, um, someone approached me afterwards and, you know, I, I, what, what do I preach about with the mystical life? You know, I don't have any other message. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm preaching, and over the days, and I, I see that you know some some people are really into it, and then they're they're with me, um, and then uh, they're really excited, and then you know and we're meeting, they're talking, they're telling me about it, and that's how it's resonating and that thing. But then I also notice some in the in the congregation, it's more like this. <laughs> um, and so by that I'll always tends to be. So there's a little bit of a mix. Um, and then, um, so then, you know, I'm a few days into it, and then um, one of the people comes up to me, and we're, we're talking, and uh, she's like, um, um, no, what, what you're describing is not how it is. It's not how it is. Um, and, um, you know, she lived a dedicated life to the Lord for many years. Uh, it's not how it is. Um, and uh, so, and I respected her, so it was kind of painful uh, to, to take, uh, to hear. Um, and then I began like, second-guessing myself. And, and, then, uh, and then I, but then I came to the conclusion, um, I have no other message. <laughs> I have no other message. 
And, uh, you know, we see it in the prophets in the Old Testament. You, you have to stick with the message given you to by the Lord. And it's not always going to be met with acceptance and wholehearted embrace. You have to be like Jeremiah, that fortified wall of brass uh, that just keeps on speaking it. And the Lord will fight for you. He'll, he'll defend for you. Uh, so I just thought, okay, um, you know, maybe... Maybe the message is for like 10% of the people in the congregation, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, so that was, that was my, my conclusion. Um, fast forward about uh, a year, year and a half later, I get a phone call from her. <laughs> um, and then she says, so she says that. So after this retreat and through the influence of like, two or three other priests um, who had a lot of uh, influence as well over her. Um, you know, I had to talk, you know, we hadn't been in contact for, for months or years, you know. Okay, but so after the retreat, basically things started to happen <laughs> in her spiritual life. <laughs> thing, 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 things began to happen. And um, she said at one point, she's sitting there before the Lord. And, you know, this is months, this is like a year after it happened, and she's still, like, tearing up, I can tell, as she's on the phone, as she's describing it. She says, one time I was sitting there, and um, I asked the Lord, I said, you know, Lord, yeah, what, what, what do you think of me? She asked the Lord. Uh, and very simply, she heard in the depths of her heart, my sister my bride. My sister, my bride. Uh, and yeah, she's getting choked up as, as she's telling me and that those words have, be, have continued to echo in her soul. My sister and my bride. And so, you know, those are words from Song of Songs and very simple. Uh, and sometimes the Lord speaks them with power and conviction and, and confidence you know, those are words she heard many times right before and read them many times. Uh, but they, they came with the power and they came as a word of love that pierced her heart and they're continuing to echo in her soul to this day as a result. So that's you know, a powerful visitation of the word to her and it's using the words of scripture, words that we hear in the liturgy, uh, that we hear in the writings of the saints. And yeah, sometimes, just like for all of us, sometimes you just go through the words and it just doesn't penetrate, but sometimes it does. And it strikes you to the core. So yeah, it can be that simple. My sister, my bride. Her life has changed. <laughs> so yeah, these are, um, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. And it often comes through the words of Scripture, the Word of God. And then some phrases that St. Bernard used to describe this word. He speaks about living for the Word. I'm going to do that. And then uh, just a little later, conceiving by the Word. You live for the Word. You dedicate your life to it. Put it into practice. You live for the Word. And then you conceive by the Word. It bears fruit for yourself, for others. The Word is fruitful in your soul, in that fruitful soil, that well-prepared soil. Live for the word and conceive by the word. Sermon 85. Lean on the word. Rest on the word. Also Sermon 85. So to lean on the word, rest on the word, live live for the word, conceive by the word, repose in the word. So that's that's the profundity of, of the word for St. Bernard and these other people. Uh, the way we want it to be for us too. Godfrey of Admont, another uh, Benedictine monk. Sacred scripture is the breast of Jesus, is the heart of Jesus. So to lean upon the sacred scriptures, the word, is to also lean upon the heart of Jesus. Um, and there's this idea that <clears throat> the scriptures, you know, what's, what's eternal life? But to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And scripture brings and brings us into this knowing and loving of God. A knowing that surpasses all knowing. 
to use Ephesians chapter 3's language at the end there. To know the breadth, length, height, and depth, the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. To know what surpasses all knowledge. And so the, if that's eternal life, John 17, 3, to know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. The scriptures bring us to that. So the scriptures are a foretaste of eternal life. So you get that a lot in these church fathers as they think about scripture and these monks. It's a foretaste of eternal life. What is knowledge of scripture but eternal life, they say. Because it's bring the words of scripture bring you into contact with the reality that they describe, the reality of God. And what is that but eternal life? begun in this life and brought to its completion in, in the next, in the beatific vision. But even in this life of faith through the veil, <clears throat> we already have a taste of it. We already have a taste of it. Here's um, a, a passage from St. William of Tiri, and he's a Benedictine monk, St. Bernard's best friend uh, during their lives. And uh, William of St. Thierry says this, and it's about wisdom, the wisdom we get from the scriptures, the wisdom who is the Son himself. So that, that phrase shows up a lot in John Cross, wisdom, the bridegroom, wisdom who is the bridegroom. And remember what we learned about wisdom from uh, spiritual theology. Uh, wisdom is a tasting of the Lord. It's an experiential knowledge of the Lord. It's a knowledge of the Lord based on love, on charity, this experiential knowing and loving about the Lord, that's wisdom. The gift of the Holy Spirit, that's wisdom. And so as they're caught up in love of the Word, they, they also they are caught up in, in love of wisdom. And it is back and forth. It all means the same thing. Uh, who is the bridegroom? So William of St. Thierry writes, A wisdom is rightly placed in the mind. For the mind is a particular strength of the soul whereby we cleave to God and enjoy God. And through the intellect, we take reality into ourselves. Through the will, we go out to the reality. So St. Thomas. Um, the mind is a particular strength of the soul whereby we cleave to God and enjoy God. This enjoyment, however, is a sort of divine savor. So wisdom comes from savor, sapientia from support. I and mean, we saw that already. And it's and St. Bernard as well, explicitly so in St. Bernard. Sapientia from Sapor. Uh, so wisdom is rightly placed in the mind, for the mind is the particular strength of the soul whereby we cleave to God and enjoy God. This enjoyment, however, is a sort of divine savor. So wisdom comes from savor. Sapientia from Sapor. This savor is a sort of tasting. This is the taste which the spirit of understanding gives us in Christ. Namely, the understanding of Scripture and of the mysteries of God. For when we begin not only to understand, but even somehow, I say, to touch and handle the inner meaning of Scriptures and the power of God's mysteries and sacraments with the hand of experience, so the Scripture as a sacrament, bringing forth the reality it bears, for when we begin not only to understand, but even somehow, I say, to touch and handle the inner meaning of scriptures and the power of God's mystery and sacraments with the hand of experience, then at last wisdom accomplishes what is proper to it. By its anointing, it teaches all things. Then by having affixed the seal of God's goodness on us, it imprints and conforms to itself by this anointing, everything calmed and made gentle within us. O oh, blessed knowledge, wherein is contained eternal life. That life comes from this tasting, because to taste is to understand. O oh, kiss of eternity. So that's what we have in the sacred scriptures. And that's the basis of this mysticism of the word that we'll hear more from St. Bernard uh, the second half of the class after a little uh, tea break.